All right, good afternoon. Yeah, hi. All right, so today um, we have a, a special treat today. We're going to be using a different format than we've done uh, for most of our recent talks. Uh, we're going to be having an, an informal, an informative and potentially informal, but potentially formal, we'll see, <laughs> um, conversation with Ms. Sylvia Flores, who is a San Jose State alumna in uh, chemical engineering. So she's a graduate of our college, has been potentially in this room and many other rooms in the building taking classes. Um, and currently she is the CEO and co-founder of Manos Accelerator. So what I'd like to do is start by sharing a little bit about Sylvia's background and her achievements, and then um, I'll come up and, and uh, we'll start the, the conversation. So she earned her Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering here at San Jose State. She was an active member of the Society of Latino Engineers and Scientists, or SOLAS. She worked for six years as an environmental engineer for IBM, and then in 2003, she worked with the former president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, to establish a technology incubator for Mexican entrepreneurs right here in Silicon Valley. She co-founded Manos Accelerator and started as its CEO in May of 2013. Uh, in addition to her work in startups, she has also served as the regional national vice president for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, SHIP, and was awarded the Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2003 from Latino Style Mag Magazine. So what I'll do is I'll ask a few questions to get the conversation started, but then I'd like you to also think of your own questions, uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for that. And then, um, but just do keep in mind that we are recording this, as we always do, and so when you raise your hand, we're gonna run and get you a, a microphone, uh, so just refrain from starting your question until you've got the mic in your hand so that we'll be able to record that. Uh, so I think with that, I'll come up here. You'll sit down. All right, so the, the first question is uh, just an overview question, Sylvia. So sure. if you could just talk about how did you get to where you are today? <laughs> Great question. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. yeah? Okay, um, so I'm gonna give you a little background where I grew up. Um, I came to San Jose State. I'm from actually from the east side of San Jose. Who knows where the east side is? Who's here from the east side of San Jose? Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so um, I grew up in East San Jose. Um, as a young person, I've always liked to cook. I don't know why I like that. So I liked cooking a lot. And so when I started taking chemistry classes, um, I really thought it was fascinating <laughs> where you can make different things. Um, from there, I applied to the School of Engineering. I was accepted to the School of, of Chemical Engineering. It was probably the hardest time of my life. <laughs> I probably lived in this dungeon. I didn't even know what day it was and what year it was. Just basically studying all the time. Um, I graduated and then I was offered a job at IBM in the South San Jose. I was also a summer intern there. I want to give you some advice um, that I think all of you here are engineering degree majors, correct? Yeah? That is probably one of the things that I will always um, be grateful for. Because as I was coming to school, I was working and going to school at the same time. And I know many, many of you are doing that as well. I know it's really difficult, but if you could get a job in the summer or be an intern at one of the companies in the Valley, it's going to really help you because you're going to start seeing what industry and how can you apply what you're studying at, here at the university. From there, um, I was, um, had an amazing career. I was in the environmental department, uh, environmental engineering and I was in charge of disposing of hazardous waste, um, which is chemicals that literally could kill you. And what I really liked about my degree and my major here was I didn't want to go refine oil or go to a <laughs> refinery. I know Chevron was in, on campus a lot and all of the refinery companies. I didn't want to go that route, so I wanted to go in, in different, a different route in tech. And at that time, Google, um, IBM was making, you guys all know what servers are, right? So at that time, they were making the disk drives where they had like this MR head, MR head, head going on top of the, the disk, reading um, and retrieving data. And that little head, that little piece of magnetic head that's on top of the disk, it takes over a thousand chemicals 
to put that together. That technology was amazingly way advanced. Um, and those chemicals uh, are really dangerous to humans, to the environment. So I was given the task to make sure that it never reached the ground, the air, and it stayed contained, and especially contained not affecting humans or any of the employees that were working in the labs or in the manufacturing lines that were exposed to these chemicals. Um, and so my task was to make sure they were disposed, they were recycled, or they were incinerated, um, and we were protecting the environment. I think that was probably the most gratifying job I've had because we were making sure we were cleaning the environment, not just polluting it. Um, and there was companies, I don't know if you all know this, but in Silicon Valley, there's been a lot of bad actors um, in manufacturing in the 90s, where in 80s and companies were dumping their hazardous waste on the side of the road. It was going to our creeks. And there was a, 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 a semiconductor company near IBM that polluted the area, and it was, it was closed off to be a super fund. I don't know if you know all this, but just to give you an insight, it's really important that the environment is taken care of. And I'm so a green person that I was like, this is my job. Um, it was a great um, career there. Um, I got to travel different parts of the world. Uh, I was exposed to corporate America. I got a lot of training. It was amazing. Uh, from there, I was um, looking at what the future was coming. And the future was manufacturing was leaving our country. It was leaving to Asia. It was leaving to Mexico. So these type of manufacturing jobs were going overseas. And I thought, OK, what is coming? What is, what's the future looking like? Uh, you know, I was very lucky. I had a lot of mentors um, in the company at IBM where I was working at. I also advise you, when you do take a job in a big company, look for people in the company that could be your mentor. Uh, these are senior executives, people who've been at the company, know what the trends are coming, and they could give you advice. And I had probably like three mentors, and I always would go up to them and say, what do you think I should do with my career? Should I go get an MBA? Should I go get my master's? And they looked at me, and they said, well, what makes you tech? What is it that you like? So we started looking at different, different um, industries. And I came to the conclusion, I want to start my own company. So I left IBM. Everybody was like, you're crazy. Why are you <laughs> doing that? Um, and I had a really, I just had a really big insight of myself. I had a lot of, how can I say this? I was very determined. And I had um, just a positive uh, encouragement with myself. And I trusted my gut that I could make a difference of helping people get online um, and, and grow their businesses. And let me tell you where I came to that conclusion. When I was at IBM, um, some of our manufacturing was leaving the country, so I was, I was asked to transfer into the sales um, OEM department. So there was a lot of engineers that were helping the sales teams go out and talk to startups and sell them servers that IBM was selling. So I was going, I was being invited to all these parties and all these young kids like making, making like millions of dollars in all their startups and we were selling them the IBM servers and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> there's something wrong with this picture. So that's why I came to the conclusion, I was like, you know what, I think I could do this. And so basically I did my research and I launched a company. I didn't have any mentors, I didn't have any investors, I didn't have what a lot of startups have today. Um, I didn't even know how to where to register the company. I mean, I was just doing this all on my own. I was going to different organizations online and finding the information. I launched the company. It was, I was uh, a company that brought in Latino businesses online. So we, at that time, we were showing restaurants, law firms, accounting companies. Uh, you name it, how to get an email, how to even have a database where you could keep track of all of your uh, accounting, like how to do a back end, how to get a website going. I mean, it was amazing uh, run as far as like getting customers. Um, and let me tell you, once you have a company, you really have to decide if there's a market there and if there's customers. If you have customers, you're going to survive. 
So basically, I hired a team. Um, we ended up growing in Los Angeles. Um, and at, at that point, it got so busy that I had to literally live in LA for two years um, and grow the company. From there, I sold it to another company that really liked what we were doing. And after that, I took a trip all to Europe and bought a house. And <laughs> that was that. That was an interesting run. <laughs> From there, um, where I'm going to talk to you, let's fast forward now to 2019. Um, over that journey from having that startup, I learned a lot of things. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I don't regret them because when you learn from something that you, you did and it didn't affect you the way you wanted it to, you learn from those mistakes and you don't repeat them again. Um, so along the way, I, I was very fortunate to meet some venture capital people, very wealthy individuals that were looking to invest in companies. So I was hired by them to look at companies, invest in companies. Um, and then we also um, had the opportunity to work for the president of Mexico. What, we, what I did there for one year is I helped him um, create an, an incubator. So it was an incubator that was, state, that was launched here in San Jose for Mexican nationals to come to Silicon Valley and, and launch their companies. Um, so after all that information of, of uh, starting an incubator, I was approached by two individuals here in San Jose that are HR managers. And what they were telling me is that they were all day processing visas for engineers from other countries because we don't have enough here in our own backyard. And they told me, you know what, um, why don't we start an accelerator and we focus in on Latino founders. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what would that look like? I don't even know them really well. So basically I got to know them over a period of time and we started Manos Accelerator 2011. It launched, it was a Google, uh, Google for Entrepreneurs helped us launch that accelerator. Today we have 145 companies in the portfolio. We have an office in Sand Hill Road, um, I'm sorry, on Centeno Row, um, <laughs> and the other one is in San Francisco. Um, so that is where I'm at today. I am the CEO and I recruit startups from all over the US here in our own backyard. Latin America, and uh, the next cohort that we're going to be accepting into the program starts in March. All right. Wow. What a story. So along the way, um, what would you say has been your biggest surprise about your career journey? Um, biggest surprise. That is so, there's so much opportunities in Silicon Valley. And my biggest surprise is um, that I think sometimes that we live in our own little bubble and we don't go and explore mm -hmm. all the different opportunities that there is in this valley and also to start your own company and not to be afraid. Yeah. And um, my biggest surprise now is, did you know less than 1% of Latino entrepreneurs are being funded in, in Silicon Valley? And that's one of the reasons we, we launched the accelerator and we're changing that number. So um, with your accelerator, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you're facing in terms of trying to change those numbers or other, other aspects around that challenge? Right. Um, I think the biggest challenge is um, getting to know the venture capital world. Uh, that's where all the money is. Uh, those are all the investors that live on Sand Hill Road or have their offices on Sand Hill Road, San Francisco. The biggest challenge is, is convincing them that uh, women of color, uh, minorities have amazing, they're, create, they're creators, innovators, they have amazing companies, they need to look and give them a chance um, to look at their, at their companies and invest in them. Um, and I think that has been the biggest challenge. We, uh, come up with, we came up with the plan to solve that. Let me tell you what we did. So I got together with the company in India and we put together a platform that has artificial intelligence in it. And we, it took us three years to populate the platform with over 29,000 investors around the world, from family offices to microfunds to VCs to um, individual 
uh, accredited investors and we put them into this platform. So when a, a startup is looking to raise capital, we launch a campaign like a social, like a Facebook ad and we put it on the platform and we have all these millions of eyeballs looking at your company and if they're interested, they reply back to me. So that's what we did. Nice. It's working. All right. Um, so what helps to keep you passionate about your work or what drives you? Um, I think what drives me is when I see startups come into our accelerator and they're young, young people just like you guys um, you know, some of them graduated in engineering, some of them graduated in business, some of them didn't graduate at all from a university, and they have these amazing solutions that I want to say in, in technology. And sometimes they don't have enough confidence in themselves, um, but they're coming to us to help them. And um, taking them from a simple idea to a full-blown company and um, helping them grow and introducing them to mentors and to investors and seeing them actually get funded and take off, that is probably what makes me drive every day. And when we see them take off like that and they're just generating revenue, they're growing their businesses, and they never thought in a million years that would ever happen to them, um, it's probably the most gratifying time for us. Wow, what an answer. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll open it up to the students for your questions. So uh, you talked in the beginning, uh, when you talked about your career journey, about what it was like for you here as a student and you said you were in a dungeon and you were studying all the time. Um, that might sound familiar out there, maybe, <laughs> if people raising their hand. Um, so, so what would you advise our students who are here now to be doing so that uh, we that our students can be better prepared for the marketplace, just both what y'all might be entering within um, a year or two or three from now, or uh, how to think about how to be prepared for 10, 20, 30 years out over the course of your careers. What would you suggest? Okay, um, I would recommend one thing or several things. Um, first of all, always be online and looking at what your major is doing. What is like if you're a chemical engineer or you're a mechanical engineer or electrical engineer, what is trending in that discipline, what in that sector of technology? And always try to go get a company, try to get recruited by a company that is really gonna, you're really gonna feel that you're contributing and that you can make a difference there. Um, as far as being here at the university while you're still a student, I recommend to um, reach out to see who, what company that you really would like to go work for. And who here, who, who's in LinkedIn here? Who has LinkedIn profiles? Yeah? Right, LinkedIn, okay. Not Facebook, LinkedIn. <laughs> um, really concentrate on putting a LinkedIn profile um, on how you would like somebody to see you or your perceived on, online. Um, because let me tell you something, everybody that is gonna be hiring you or looking at you as a potential person to bring into their organization are gonna look at your LinkedIn profile. Uh, I would put like any uh, awards or any papers or any projects you did at the university, put them on there. Another thing too is that everybody's on social media. Uh, be careful what you have on your Facebook because they go on Facebook and they look. They're gonna go see what you've done. And if you have some crazy stuff in there, and they're gonna be, oh, I don't know if this person is the right person in our team. So that's the advice I would give you is try to put together a profile that's impressive and always think about leadership. They're always looking for people who have leadership skills. Have confidence in yourself. Prep yourself into your profile. Make sure that everything in that profile is going to be super um, impressive to somebody that's going to read it. All right, great. So I think at this point, let's turn it over to you to see if you have questions uh, for Sylvia. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Yeah. 
Hello, Ms. Sylvia. Thank you for coming. It's an honor to have you here. Yeah. Um, I have a question as well. Um, similar to you, I'm also working full-time as an engineer while also studying engineering at San Jose State. Do you have any recommendations in terms of time management? <laughs> Good question. Especially this time in the semester. Yeah. yeah. So what I did is um, when I was having finals, I would go talk to my managers and tell them, you know what, I, I just, there's no way I could be here. Like, I have to really study. And so basically what I did is I worked out a schedule with them. And I said, okay, maybe the weekend. Well, at that time, you know, IBM was working 24 hours every single day. So to them, it was like, okay, well, let's just work on your schedule. And then there was some times that the semester was pretty heavy. I would just not go at all to, uh, to work. Um, I would just tell them it's just, it's just way too much for me. And then there were some times where they're like, I was getting close to graduating and uh, I was just pulling all-nighters, but you know, you can't do that as you get older. <laughs> so don't do that, but if you can, I did that. Um, I, like I said, I would just talk to your, to your employer and especially if you're an engineer in the Valley, they work with you because they need more engineers. So you're like, you're a commodity in this town. They want as many as, as engineers as they can. So work with your, with your company. Yeah, other questions? So I noticed you said that uh, manufacturing jobs you noticed are leaving. So I'm curious, like if those jobs are leaving, like are there any jobs coming in? Like what can we expect? Good question. Mm -hmm. Have you guys read about all the all of the um, robots that are coming? Have you seen? There's a book that also. That's another thing I should tell you guys. Read books. That is going to be the probably the best thing I could advice I could give you today. The more you learn, the more you earn. Remember that. There's two books that I want you guys to read. There's one called Venture Deals. That's like the Bible in Silicon Valley. Everybody has that book. That is, if you're ever going to go into venture, uh, you're going to have a startup and you want to raise capital, that book is like a Bible. The other one is Zero to One um, by Peter Thiel. Anybody here know who Peter Thiel is? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Read that book. That is an amazing book. There's another book, and I can't remember the title right now, but it's, um, it's a book about talking about where the future is going in Silicon Valley, and they talk about robots are going to take over some of the manufacturing jobs and they already are and what what to expect and what type of uh, technologies you should be going into artificial intelligence is probably the number one that everybody's going towards um has anybody here had a tour of tesla who's been to tesla did you see those big old robots in the plant that they have there um, you're going to see more of that. Um, I've been seeing mobility, um, self-driving cars, all that's coming. So the, just read about what is, there's so many books out there. Um, there is a guy named, by the name of Ty Lopez, if you guys ever want to write this down. And he talks about like where the future is going and he gives you, he recommends books to read. That's where I got all of my reading list from. Um, I would recommend to go there, but I think what's, what's going to happen is there is probably going to be more, there is going to be manufacturing here, but I think it's going to be really advanced where it's going to be more of a, of a, a robot, some type of, of um, technology that's going to embed uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but again, I would go read this up on the internet. There's many books, um, and if you go to that website, you could see what what books that I think uh, are going to interest you. Got a question in the back. Hi. Uh, I was curious of if you could speak on some of the competitive advantages that Manos has in regard to the cognitive diversity that emerges from operating a startup accelerator primarily uh, serving minority entrepreneurs. What advantages we have? Yeah, like over Sand Hill Road and, you know, the VCs of old white folks. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think I could call it advantage. I just want to, I would probably say we're just layering, um, you know, putting the playing field out there um, that anybody 
that wants to start a company and happens to be a Latino person, um, you know, we provide them all the tools that will help them grow and scale their companies. Um, so they don't have to be going in circles and wasting time and money. Uh, where our program is really accelerated, we have um, a curriculum that we put together. It's a three-month curriculum starting with what is, has anybody here ever heard of a business canvas? You guys know what that is? Have you ever seen that before? No? Okay, so it's a curriculum that we put together and um, we're just uh, putting together different programs for them, different topics. We take them to different companies and meet mentors. Uh, we, we host a lot of events where we have pitch nights, where we bring in investors. Um, and we, we highly recommend that they go and network because in this town is about who you know, not what you know anymore. Um, and if you could get connected with the right people, um, you would have a, a better chance of being successful. So I that answered your question. Yeah, I, I just want to put a follow-up out there. Um, for, for people that are at student stage, do you have some specific um, advice you could share around how to start building your network? Because again, you know, sometimes you got to get out of your dungeon and, and, and get, start getting connections. So what, what yeah. would you say? You know, I would recommend, um, you guys don't know what Eventbrite is, right? Yeah? OK. Um, I would start going on the internet and going on to Eventbrite um, and looking at the events that are free um, that interest you in the sector that you're in. And go to those events and you start meeting people and then you start creating your own network of people that are interested of you or who could help you. So sometimes we have to get out of like our little bubble being here at school, go to those events. Um, and believe it or not, they have them at the Google campus, Facebook campus, um, different, you know, different companies in the Valley and get yourself out there because once you graduate, you're gonna need um, you know, HR representatives to know who you are because they're, they're gonna be the ones hiring and go to those events too where you could uh, express who you are, what, you know, what are you studying in college and when do you plan to graduate and you just need to go out there and make those relationships. Yeah, this would be a great opportunity to help plug our GO program because we also give GO points for going to any event related to your professional development. Um, other, other questions? Yeah, we've got this side, you're, you're letting us down a little bit. <laughs> this side's kind of winning over here. <laughs> um, at Manos Accelerator, what was your uh, biggest startup and what was the key to ex success? Yeah, good question too. All right, so I'll give you some ex um, give you a, uh, a story about a particular gentleman. His name is Nick Reyes. He's based out of Philadelphia. He was only 21 years old and applied to the program. He dropped out of medical school. He was accepted to, or at an early age to medical school. Um, he was a particular a, a genius person. So he applied to our accelerator and he submitted a video of a bionic eye, like a, a bionic um, contact lens, where you could see artificial, um, what is this, things moving around, um, all these crazy ideas on this contact lens. And I was like, this is like really futuristic, like this is like not real, you know, like this can't really be done. Um, and my co-founder, Ed, said, you know what, let's give them a chance. Because at that time, Google was paying for people to fly here. They were paying your three-month stay. They would pay for your food, your transportation. Everything was paid for. And I felt like, well, I think this is kind of like a joke almost. Like, I don't really think this could be done. And... Um, Anyways, I was outvoted by our team, and we, we, we flew him out here. And first time in San Jose, he's never been here in his life. Uh, he was accepted to the program along with other eight companies, you know. And they were, they were required to be in the office every day because, we, like I told you, we have a curriculum, we have speakers coming in, we have all this stuff for them. Google was coming in. It was just like 
all these events, all this curriculum. They really needed to focus on their companies. And we never saw him. We we're like, where is he? Like, I would call him on the cell phone, and it's like, where are you at? Let me tell you what he did. He figured out how to get around San Jose. He figured out where the bus were, transportation-wise, where Stanford was at, UC Berkeley. And he put together like this little package, and he went to go talk to all these engineering students from San Jose State, from Stanford, from UC Berkeley, and he recruited a team of like 10 people, and some of them were PhDs. He recruited one guy who was from the accelerator at Stanford, <laughs> and he was like the director of that thing. And he recruited this team, and we're like, what is he doing? And he started pitching to investors on his, um, on his contact lens, and he had virtual reality embedded in there. So basically, he got this team together. He was pitching to these investors. Investors were calling us like, hey, one of your startups is pitching over here. Like, this is crazy stuff. And I was like, I can't believe he's doing that. So what ended up happening is um, he ended up putting, assembling this really amazing team. They were able to go to the University of Washington and get the patent of, you know what Google Glass is, right? Well, the, the researchers, the professors, and the PhD got people at the University of Washington who came up with the Google Glass concept. The patents were at the university. They did not... They did not belong to those scientists. So when Sergi took them to Google and they developed the Google Glass, they, they didn't pay the royalties to those patents. They just took the scientists. Those scientists got a hold, Nick got a hold of them. And he even got a hold of the professor at, at University of Washington who had this lab where they had all of these contact lenses that were on the shelf. They're already um, developed. So he g g was able to get a VC, give him the money with his team. They went to the University of Washington, got, got the patent, signed a contract with the University of Washington, and took that technology. He even talked to the scientists, and some of the scientists were so upset at Google because <laughs> it was just a flop that some of them left to go work for Jeff Bezos at the secret lab that Amazon had. So he knew all these scientists, like all these people, like it was really crazy. So then he, <laughs> he put together this contact lens. So if you put a contact lens and you have one, and we both have that same contact, we could send messages to each other. Oh my gosh. And we would be the only ones seeing that message. So it was the most secure way how to communicate. He had the CIA, he had <laughs> the FBI, he had like all these government agencies. This guy was going to all these crazy meetings and he ended up going to this one VC in San Francisco and they funded him. But there was a catch. He was too young. And they looked at him and they said, we are not going to give you all these millions of dollars. You're just way too young. We're going to give it to the PhDs that you want to go contact and put on your team. And that's what ended up happening. And so the, the company took off, it's, you know, doing all this research. And he was so bummed. He was like, oh my god. Everybody thought he was going to be the next mm -hmm. Zuckerberg, right? Um, and um, that was probably one of, the, one of the companies that I saw just grow from some crazy idea to something that's being funded, taking off. Um, and so now he started another company, and it's in cannabis, um, CBD, and he's making a mask. And that's a whole different story. But that, that story or that particular entrepreneur was... Um, was amazing to see that journey take off. Wow, yeah, Jasmine. Um, what are the top things you see in, in companies when you guys are looking at whether or not to accept them into your accelerator program? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? What are the top qualities um, that you guys look for in, in companies and applicants when you guys are um, considering whether or not to accept them into your program? That's probably the number one thing I, I focus on every day. Um, do you guys all know who Ron Conway is? Who knows who Ron Conway is in this room? Nobody knows? 
Look him up. Did you know he's a graduate from here, from San Jose State? He is the number one angel in Silicon Valley that started the angel network. It's called Silicon Valley Angels. The guy's like a billionaire. He, he invested in early, 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 early Facebook, early, early, early Google, super early companies that are now like billion, worth, billion dollars now. They asked him at, a, at an event I was at, at Google, um, and he was doing a fireside chat, mm -hmm. are you and I are. And one person in the audience asked him, like, what do you look for? Like, you, you funded all these companies, and like, they all did amazingly well, but they were like super, super early when, right. they, when they approached you, and how did you, you know, invest money in them? And they said, what did you look for in those type of companies, or that individual? What was it that drove you to them? And he said, and I'll never forget it, and he said, you know, he goes, I see so many companies approach us for funding. He goes, but when I see one um, founder who has no money, uh, has like a team of engineers working for them, and they're not even being paid. They're like, they want to go work for him. They're like, tell us what you want us to do. We'll jump as high as you want us to jump. And he has like this amazing team and this amazing company or, or what they're de or developing or whatever they're doing, but he has like the best people around them and nobody's getting paid. Everybody's there because they believe in the vision, they believe in the technology. He goes, that's the guy I invest in. So getting back to your question, when we start reviewing startups to come into the accelerator, I always interview them. And I always look for one trait. One is, are you, are, are you a person that could take advice and that could take bad news? Are you um, coachable? You know, we have a lot of young people, a lot of your startups that come to our accelerator, and they have the maze, um, like they have their hopes and this amazing idea. Like this is like, this is the greatest thing. This is my baby. This is what I, you know, I want to do. This is going to make a lot of money. And by the way, I'm the only one who has this idea. And you're like, no. There's like a thousand of those ideas. However, what we look for is somebody that is mature enough, if they need to pivot, that they be able to do that and not take offensive. Because we're really, we're, we're a company, we're a team of people that we're really not there to plead your, please your ego, but we are really realistic. If things don't look good or we see that there's a competition or we see that you're gonna have problems, we wanna tell you and we wanna tell you in a nice way, like you're just like drinking Kool-Aid here, like that ain't gonna work. But we also want you to accept it and go do your own due diligence on, on that as well and not, not be offended. Um, but we look for, for, we look for people who are um, coachable, uh, people who have a drive, people who have a, a basic understanding of that particular uh, technology. So if you're a business person, you have no engineering background, and you're coming to us and say, this, this technology is the biggest thing, but you're not an engineer, how, how would you know that? Um, so that is something we look for, like you need to have a technical person in your team, so we start giving you advice. But again, it comes down to the number one thing, are you coachable? Because if you are coachable, you will be able to bring a team together. If you need a technologist, if you need a business person, you would be able to do that. All right, other questions? Oh, that side. All right, we're catching up. Hi, following up that with that conversation, how can you or how can someone remain uh, resilient after facing multiple rejections or setbacks? Okay, so I always tell the startups, number one, stay healthy. If you're gonna be resilient, that is probably a good word, very strong word to have. Um, stay, number one, stay healthy, stay happy, enjoy the journey, um, be resilient and be, um, be positive of things that happen to you and don't ever take it so personal. I know it's hard. Um, I could give you another story because I have tons of them, but I'll share them with you. 
I had this one um, young person uh, from Venezuela who went to school here. And you know the, the dire straits of their country is not good, right? Um, and I'm really proud of him. You're talking about almost homeless, didn't have anything to eat, ran out of his money, and he was so resilient. He, he came up with a, uh, an application, a platform um, an, uh, for interpreter, interpreters. So let's say you're in France, you don't know any French, and you're traveling in France, and you have your cell phone, and you get sick. And you're like, you know what, I need to tell somebody or tell the doctor what's wrong with me, but I don't speak any French. So you get the app, you go on, you download it on your phone, and you press on the app, and a French, a, per, a, per, a live person comes on that speaks French and English, and you pay per the minute. He has like an Uber kind of model there. Um, so what I did is my mom left us a house in San Jose, and we converted it to a startup house. So I let him stay there. I said, you're not going to go in the street. You're going to stay at the startup house. You're not going to cry anymore. You're going to go to the office, and you're going to work every single day, and I'm going to start introducing you to people, and you're going to make it. And he was like, uh, I was literally like almost in tears. He's like, everything I've dreamed of of my company was not going to go anywhere. He ended up going to an event for uh, startups to pitch. It's called the Raw Event from Sand Hill Angels that they have every month, and they invite all of our startups. And he went over there and he pitched them. And guess who was sitting in the audience? One of the founders of Apple. And the guy goes, you know, I really like your idea, but are you going to have to change it? And he's like, OK, let's talk. <laughs> Are you not going to believe it? He invested in him. So now what he has is he has a robot. They built this robot. And on the head of the robot is a screen, like a computer screen. And they, they take this robot all over the hospitals. And somebody who speaks Spanish or Italian or whatever language that can't communicate with the doctors, this person comes online mm -hmm. with the robot. And the robot and the person's live right there and is interpreting for the, for the patient and the doctor. And they move them everywhere. And that's what he ended up doing. It's called Yahtzee.com. He got funded. He has no more money issues. And he's driving around in a Tesla. <laughs> so there's, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, hmm, you know, that what makes you resilient? What makes you go through all these journeys? Like I tell you, you're going to have to really think deep dive inside of yourself and say, is this really what I want to do? Am I up for this task? Because it literally is a roller coaster ride. Um, if you want to be in the if you want to be an innovator, it comes with the territory. You just have to be strong. But the number one thing is stay healthy. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, maybe could you speak to the the difference in approaching risk taking and entrepreneurship um, for people that are maybe fresh out of school versus people that might be more at a later stage in their career, like you were. And maybe there's some pros and cons of each stage. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm going to talk about like when you're a millennial, you guys are all graduating, and then you go work for a major Silicon Valley company, right? That's the path I took. What I ended up doing is I started saving my money, mm. and I wanted to put money aside because if you don't have any money, you're not going to survive out there. So that's not what you want to do. So what I did is I saved my money. Um, and I calculated how much time of a runway do I need if this is going to start making me money instead of me working for a company. You have only a time limit, time. If you're going to have a year, if you're going to have two years or six months, whatever it is, to pay all your bills. The, the worst thing you want to do is get into debt. So I saved my money and I calculated, OK, I'm going to give myself one year. And all I'm going to do is work really, really hard and see if this thing grows. And that's what I ended up doing. Other people um, take another path while they're still in college um, or they just graduated. And they start a company and they live with their parents. Their parents support them or they have a supporting group, family and friends. And they support them until see if the company takes off. The risk there is that you're being dependent on somebody to give you financial help, right? 
Um, have you guys heard about the story, the people, the, the two students at Stanford that started Snapchat? Did you guys hear about that story? Nobody here has heard about that story? Yes or no? Raise up your hand, the ones who have. Okay. I think we need to hear the story for the other people. <laughs> so did you know the, the two guys that started Snapchat were students at Stanford? Did you know that? They were still at Stanford? So one of my best friends knows the investor that gave them the first half a million dollars. So what happened was, his daughter was attending a private school in Palo Alto, and she had her cell phone with her, and she was Snapchatting using the app. I think it was in beta or whatever. And she, the father told her, like, what are you doing? Why are you on this app? And she's like, everybody in the school has it. Like, it's like, it's like blowing up. And he's like, really? And he's a VC, right? <laughs> and he's like, hmm, well, what does it do? So she started telling her dad. And he's like, well, who, who put this together in the school? She goes, these two guys did. So he got off his car. He went looking for the student who told all the other students to do this in school. And he goes, there's actually two guys at Stanford. And let me give you their names. So he got in his car, drove to Stanford, started looking for them. And he found them in their dorm. And he asked them, so what do you guys do? So they showed them the, you know, the whole thing, how it worked, how they programmed it, how they coded it, blah, 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 blah. And he gave them the first investment money. Did you know when they went IPO, I think he made like, I don't know, it was so much money. It was, I don't know, it was a lot. And he donated some of the millions to the school. Mm. And um, yeah, and you know, Facebook wanted to buy them, but they didn't want to sell to Facebook. So when it went IPO, I, I, it was some, some crazy number. I don't even remember right now, but it was crazy. So those students were in Stolen College and they came up with this. So there's a lot of different stories, and there's also good, and there's also bad, and there's also ugly ones. But you have to see where you find yourself. All right, so I think we have time for a couple more questions. We've got another one in the back. Hi. Uh, after the high-profile failure of WeWork and uh, SoftBank's <laughs> eagerness, to uh, generate returns on their $100 billion vision fund. How does existing as a non-equity seed fund change your relationship with entrepreneurs? Like, how does Manos' uh, approach to mentorship and startup development differ from that of VCs like Greylock and Sequoia that are seeking 10x returns on every single entrepreneur that walks in the door? Yeah, it's really interesting what happened with WeWork, um, especially the uh, SoftBank fund yeah. that's funding them. You know Uber doesn't make any money. Do you guys know that? Mm -hmm. Did you know Tesla just started, I think last quarter, reported their first revenue, like now they're making money? I mean, all those years, they've just been like blowing all this cash. All I could tell you is um, everybody takes a risk. Um, everybody has a different path as far as like what the investors want to invest in. Um, I could speak to you about where we feel um, makes a difference when startups from Manos go raise money. I always tell them that they have to start making revenue. They have to start showing traction. They have to start proving the concept. They have to start showing that their model is making money when investors come and see them because majority of them that are getting funded are looking at those companies that have that particular um, uh, success. Now, there's companies out there that are going to need tons of money before they see a return. And this is a lot of investors know it's a four, five year, 10 year, you know, outlook. Now, what I could tell you right now, software startups, st startups that focus on software get funded faster because it's cheaper. Startups that do hardware, hardware, and I'm talking robots, I'm talking cars, I'm talking all that stuff, that is much, much more expensive. You're gonna have a up battle raising money doing those type of startups. All right, how about one more question? If no one else has one, I wanna know what it was like working with the president of a, of a country <laughs> on 
on a creating a, a startup incubator. Yeah, it was an incubator, yeah. Um, that was a really interesting uh, experience for me. I was asked by um, my dad's friend, actually my grandfather's friend, um, who was a CEO of AMD, Hector mm. Reese. I don't know if you guys, you guys know who AMD is? Yeah. Yeah, that makes chips. Um, and so basically they were, that was his, um, they were gonna put a fab in Mexico but ended up going to Germany. Um, and apparently that year was his last year in office and really wanted to make an impact for uh, Mexican nationals or Latinos in the US. So they asked me if I could advise him um, how to start that type of environment or how to grow that ecosystem. And so basically, um, it was a really great experience, me traveling with the president, having dinner with him, getting to know him as a person more rather than a president, um, and see how governments work. I was also invited to Washington. At that time, George Bush was the president. Um, so it was a great experience. I learned a lot. I made a lot of great, uh, great friends and got to meet a lot of great companies from that experience. Yeah, so it was great. All right, thanks. All right, any, any last question? Okay, I think if, if not, let's thank our speaker again.